Invenciones por Inteligencia Artificial, IA. Panelistas, Bárbara Fiaco, Apply Foleg Og, Estados Unidos. Bennett H. Rockney, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Estados Unidos. Panelista moderador, Mitch Feller, Gadliev, Rachman and Reisman, PC, Estados Unidos. Hola, buenas tardes. Bueno, bienvenidos al último panel de la tarde, del primer día de conferencias. Se trata de un panel sobre invenciones por inteligencia artificial. Voy a presentar al, brevemente al moderador. Mitchell Feller is a principal at the New York law, law firm of Gottlieb, Rackman and Riesman, an intellectual property boutique founded in 1970. A large part of his practice focuses on patent matters including prosecution, litigation, offensive and defensive portfolio analysis and development, risk assessment and product clearance, and strategic IP counseling. Mr. Feller has degrees in electrical engineering from Columbia University and received a law degree from the New York University. Before becoming a lawyer, he worked as a computer designer, design engineer uh, at uh, IBM. Mitch, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, everybody, for sticking around, given the, the time. I'd like to first introduce my co-panelists, uh, Ben Rockney and Barbara Fiaco. Uh, ben is MIT's technology licensing officer for medical devices. Uh, before joining MIT, Ben led product development at the director and vice president level, also working through international and US joint development partnerships. He has a PhD in physics from Cornell, and during the first half of his career, he produced diverse products for medical, industrial, and consumer imaging, drawing from the fields of electrical, optical, laser, and CMOS engineering. In 2001, he transitioned into biotech, developing instruments for proteomics and cell-based assays before ending up in antibiotic drug discovery. Ben has been MIT's technology licensing officer for medical devices for nearly five years, licensing in the fields of digital health, therapeutics, medical devices, prosthetics, biomaterials, and laboratory instrumentation. He finds his life at MIT licensing office to be a fascinating blend of science, business, and law. Barbara Fiaco is a partner and co-chair of the patent and related dispute practice at the law firm of Foley Hogue, and she currently serves as president of the American Intellectual Property Law Association. Barbara is a graduate of Dartmouth, and Harvard Co Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School. She handles complex intellectual property and business disputes, including inventorship disputes. And her technology-related practice focuses on the life science, including therapeutic proteins and antibodies, small molecule compounds, drug delivery systems, molecular diagnostics, and medical devices. Barbara is recognized as a leading IP lawyer in the best lawyers in America, IAM Patent 1000, Managing Intellectual Properties IP Stars and Top 250 Women. She was also named Boston's Biotechnology and Life Science Practice Lawyer of the Year in the 2018 and 2020 edition of Best Lawyers. So in our discussion today, we're going to have three separate sections and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. I'll be giving a brief introduction and overview of some issues that are relevant to the discussion. Then we'll be talking about issues uh, related to protection of inventions that involve artificial intelligence. And Barbara will be discussing about challenges that exist for protecting inventions that are generated by artificial intelligence. So the first question, of course, is when we're talking about artificial intelligence or AI, uh, what do we mean by that? Computers are good at math, computers are good at running lots of numbers, and when we talk about an AI 
system. What we're really talking about is a computer that has been programmed to do something that's typically requiring human intelligence of some sort. Uh, creative analysis, judgment calls, uh, distinguishing between, uh, on the internet, you know, cats and dogs, figuring out where faces are in pictures. These are things that people find easy to do but are very difficult to get a computer to do them. And AI is, is ubiquitous. I see a lot of people out there with cell phones. Um, if you see the little box that gets drawn around the picture, that's an artificial intelligence system. If you've ever gone and logged on to a video streaming service or Amazon, the suggestions that come up are all AI. These are all systems that take in vast amounts of data, learn different patterns, and then use that to make some sort of judgment. Looking at the patent side of protection of AI technology, what we can see is that there is a huge uptick of patent applications that have been filed in the last several years. Uh, on a technology basis, there are several different ways in which you can craft an AI system, several different types of technology, but what you can see by far, uh, upwards of 80% of the applications that have been filed deal with the type of AI called machine learning. And from a, a um, category basis in terms of industry, by far the largest patents that are being filed, largest numbers, are in the areas of transportation and telecommunication. Uh, following up very closely are personal devices, uh, human computer interaction on one side, uh, data security, emails, things like that, and life and medical sciences. Uh, and so we can see that the, the idea of AI and the patents are becoming more and more important and the processes uh, to protect them and the system and the, uh, the results of using these systems are becoming more sophisticated. Once you have an AI system and you're dealing with researchers, of course the question is, what role does the AI system play during the invention process. And we can think of that as a, as a continuum. On the one side, there are systems where the AI is just a tool and you have a human that conceives of the invention and is just using the computer to help reduce it to practice or maybe verify the results. Uh, from a patent protection standpoint, that's what most people on the patent world deal with on a daily basis and there's nothing really new there. On the other end of the spectrum, are AI systems where the artificial intelligence computer acting on its own identifies that there's some sort of problem and then generates the invention on its own. And in that situation, you have an invention that exists solely uh, because of the AI system. Uh, there, we end up with lots of different problems because across the world, in order to get a patent, you need a human inventor. And in this case, there's no human that's directly involved in the actual process itself. The area where we're most likely to run into issues now is the one in the middle, where you have a collaborative effort between a researcher, an engineer, who's using the AI system to help them to develop the results uh, and solve a solution, but where the collaboration, if you looked at it and thought of the AI system as a second person, would be viewed as a co-inventorship issue, or where the first person might even be viewed as simply having issued an invitation to invent without understanding or knowing how the result was going to come out. And the AI system then generates the result. And again, if it was, not a, if it was a person, there'd be no issues. But because we now have a computer as a joint inventor or a sole inventor, depending on how you define invention, there's no good way to fit that into current law. As a way to help uh, understand some of the issues about protecting systems that involve AI, uh, I'd like to just very briefly run through the types of technologies that are involved uh, in an AI machine learning system. And most of these systems have uh, several basic parts that all have different types of technology in them. If we run through the block diagram, we start out by seeing that we take the raw data coming in, there's usually some sort of pre-processing system that will digest the data and convert it into a form that the rest of the computer can understand. Then you get to the AI data processing itself where the information that's been fed in is analyzed and that system comes out with some sort of decision or output and it could be an indication that your email is a spam, it could be that the traffic is really heavy if you go on the expressway so you should take a side trip. Uh, and then the result is that you need to take some sort of action. Maybe you block the email, maybe you make the car turn left instead of right in an autonomous system. And these types of AI systems of course are much, much more complicated 
things are organized in many different ways and combined, but they all have the same basic systems at one form or another. Now, if we look in the technology, just to think of it as a slightly more you know, detailed example, uh, let's talk about an AI system that we want to design to make a decision between two different things. We have our examples of spam, uh, emails, uh, financial analysis system, they say, do I buy or sell stock? And an example I have here, which uh, if those of you who have been to New York may appreciate is not completely trivial, uh, is whether or not something that you're shown the computer is a bagel or a donut. Uh, and so the way you would start is you make a collection of information of things that you already know are bagels and already know are donuts, and that collection is called your training data. And the trick with the computer is to somehow get the computer to decide, given uh, a point coming in, a point of data, which would represent a picture of a different object, whether that's a bagel or a donut. And you could try drawing a vertical line, a horizontal line, diagonal or curved, and all of these may give you reasonably accurate results, but they're not going to be as accurate as you like. And so that's where you get into the power of these machine learning neural networks. Now, the diagram that I have up on the screen uh, is a sample of a very, very simple neural network, but if you've ever looked at a machine learning application, uh, patent application, you'll see diagrams like this in many different places. And without going into the, the detailed math and science behind it, all a neural network is, it's a way to take the inputs coming in, in this case, properties of the bagel or the donut, whatever it is, take those values and apply them in a weighted manner to a series of internal nodes, what we call the hidden layer, and each one of those applies a mathematical function that itself can be weighted or biased, and then the output of those gets fed into the output layers, which give a probability as to whether the system thinks you have a bagel or a donut. Now, the important point for purposes of machine learning is that nobody knows what these numbers should be when they start. They could be set to random values, and what the computers, scientists and engineers will do is they will train the system by applying the training data, and then using a second program that sits on the side, looks at the output and slowly adjusts the values inside in order to improve the accuracy of the results. And this process can repeat tens or hundreds of thousands of times, but at the end, what you have is a trained neural network that has learned to the extent it can based on your training data, whether the picture that you're feeding it is going to be a bagel or a donut. And one thing to appreciate is once that's done, all of the baggage associated with it, the training data, the, the, the learning algorithms, the way to adjust it, can be thrown out, and you can replicate the neural network anywhere you want by simply copying the structure of the computer linkages and the values. And so there are issues about what to protect and how to protect that, and, and Ben will be discussing those uh, problems uh, next. Uh, one term that comes up frequently in AI is also a deep learning network. And the main difference between this and a regular learning network is simply a deep learning network has many more internal layers of nodes. And this makes the system much more complicated, but it also makes it much more powerful. And by using a deep learning network, the AI systems can make much more subtle and uh, granular decisions about the data coming in. So once you have an AI system, uh, the trick is now what are you going to do with it? Many people have been working to generate uh, creative outputs from an artificial intelligence system. And uh, for the last decade or so, it's not been unusual to find computer-generated music, computer-generated art, uh, news articles. I even last week went on the internet and found somebody advertising an AI system that would generate a logo for a business if you fed it some information about what you were doing. And these are all things that people would normally think is creative. On the technical side, people have been working for decades to develop computer systems that themselves would generate new inventions, and new innovations are being developed from those. And so we end up with a, a divide in terms of what we're going to look at protecting. On the one hand, you can protect the artificial intelligence system itself and the internals and how everything fits together, but if the AI system invents something like a, like a new uh, network or a new battery or an improved carburetor, that can be protected independently without any ties to the technology that generated. And so what we have is the, we're at the stage where computer companies and AI systems are developing more and more powerful systems to do this type of creative work. 
Uh, and uh, the middle point where I say on the horizon, I'm not, not entirely accurate. Uh, there have been several documented cases of a computer-generated invention that's been filed in the patent office, patents have been granted on them, but they've been filed naming a human inventor. Uh, I, and without knowing exactly why, usually it's probably because without putting a person's name down, they would never get their patent. Uh, this is an example just uh, of a patent that was filed about 25 years ago by Dr. Stephen Thaler, and it's an example of an early system that is designed to follow a creative process. And if we see the way it's described, it provides a way to design around ordinary and new ordinary and create new designs in the same way a creative designer would do. In other words, the system brainstorms. And more recently, Dr. Thaler, along with uh, his colleagues, developed a improved system called the Davis AI. And this one's uh, been in the news a lot. Some of you may have heard about it because recently they issued some press releases saying that patent applications have been filed in the United States, in Europe, in the UK, I believe in Israel as well, naming as the sole inventor the a system and methods that have been output by this computer system. And this raises the question, of course, how are these things going to be treated? Uh, my understanding from some articles, because the applications have not been officially published yet, is that from a technical standpoint, in the EU they've been examined and they've been found to uh, be, have an inventive step, be patentable, other than whether or not there's a human inventor. Uh, I've read in that in the United States there's been a preliminary rejection or notice from the U.S. Patent Office saying that they won't process the application unless they name a person. So it'll be very interesting to see how those go. And these decisions will then create uh, appealable rulings that can then be brought up in the patent courts and, and in the local governments to help push the issues. And just very briefly, so the two things Davis invented, uh, it's a fractal container that helps hold food. And then the second one is a flashing light that apparently blinks in a pattern that synchronizes with your brain waves and so it'll be more noticeable. And in an interview, Dr. Thaler said he has no background or knowledge about either of these things. And so even if he set the computer up, there'd be no reason to name him as the inventor. Now, whether that's actually true, whether he used the system as a tool or not, it would take a lot of digging, but it's been done in order to bring this issue to the public. And that has certainly been an effective thing for it. I'd like to turn the discussion now over to my colleague, Ben, who will be discussing about uh, patent protection issues for AI-related inventions. Uh, good, more, or good afternoon. Thank you um, to SAP for, uh, for the invitation. It's a real privilege to be here and to meet many of you. So, so thank you very much. As Mitch said, I'm MIT's licensing officer for medical devices, and I'll be talking really about the current state of patenting in artificial intelligence. And um, MIT, as of yet, has not had invention disclosures received where the AI is the pure inventor, as Mitch was just describing. But so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the kind of the current state of patenting, and then Barbara will pick up more of the forward-looking discussion of what does it mean when AI really is the inventor. So that's how the rest of the rest of the afternoon will go. So Mitch showed this figure of a typical machine learning invention, and I'm going to be focusing completely on machine learning, and more typically actually in, in deep learning or deep neural networks. So he showed this figure where uh, there's a process of data coming in. The data is typically pre-processed in a way that makes it um, a uniform representation that could be presented to the AI. You might take a Fourier transform of data that's in time. You might take sort of the duration between successive events and capture that duration or the variability of the duration. There's millions and millions of different ways of pre-processing the data. The data is fed into a machine learning classifier, the, the actual artificial intelligence. Mitch described how with data, um, an outside computer can look at that neural network and tweak the biases and the linkages and the weightings in order to create a desired output. And then, of course, we take action on that output. And of course, it's called machine learning because it's an iterative process. One trains the network with a set of data. One verifies the output of the 
artificial intelligence with a new set of data, making sure that what you predict to happen will. And then you go out and you start using it with real world, real, real world data. And that might be the end of the story, but more typically, as more and more data accumulates, the model gets better and better and better. So for example, Google Translate has been growing and becoming better and better and better through the years to become a more and more powerful tool. And so there is very much an iterative process, which in itself can represent a challenge to, to patenting. But when you look at this system, what is it that you patent? There's a number of different areas that, that one could focus on and try to patent. So you could try to patent the classifier itself as a black box. It's just some, uh, some box with data in and unknown coefficients coming out. You could try to patent new inventions and how the classifier is structured, how those nodes are connected, and maybe these nodes all show feeding forward. Maybe you could have feedback nodes, things like that. A very, very common approach to patenting an artificial intelligence is to try to patent the construction of the features that are used, or you can try to patent the entire system. And I'll show you a couple of examples at the end that um, cover all of, these, all of these possibilities. Now, it's important to note, as you might imagine, that the whole topic of patenting artificial intelligence is continually evolving, as is some of the key rulings on software and algorithms in the United States and Europe. And so, at least in the United States, the whole subject of patenting AI is really evolving in the context of patent-eligible su subject matter and the ALICE ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. And so the ALICE ruling said that, well, I'm sorry, not the ALICE ruling. I mean, in general, patenting uh, claims may not be directed to anything that's considered a judicial exception. And of course, E equals MC squared is a classic example. Laws of nature, natural phenomena. And the thing that had played such a role in the ALICE decision, abstract ideas are not patentable. This is often summarized as saying you can't patent software or you can't patent an algorithm. It turns out as the... Uh, repercussions of the Alice ruling have evolved, that's probably too strong a statement. And so without going into a lot of detail, one could talk for many, many hours on Alice. Really, the general claim strategy since Alice has been to try to turn software and algorithms from an abstract idea into something that has a very hard, tangible output, to tie the abstract concept to something tangible. And frankly, this has had mixed and very inconsistent success. It really is very examiner dependent, and again, it has been evolving. However, um, in January of 2019, the U.S. Patent Office, not the Supreme Court, but the U.S. Patent Office issued new guidance to its examiners on how to interpret Section 101 and the Alice ruling. And this has really changed the game. I'll get back to that in a moment. But um, the, the guidance says that a claim that recites a judicial exception, something that is generally not, not necessarily considered patentable subject matter, a claim that recites a judicial exception is not directed to the judicial exception if the judicial exception is integrated into a practical application of the ju judicial exception. Somebody likes those words a lot. But it's really saying that if you can take this judicial exception, this algorithm, this artificial intelligence, this software, and integrate it into something very practical and tangible, uh, you probably will have success. And I've personally been involved in two phone calls with examiners over um, software in one case and artificial intelligence in another, where the initial office action was a Section 101 rejection, and we asked for a telephone interview with the examiner. We got on the telephone prepared for an hour debate with the examiner, and we said we'd like to discuss the 101 rejection first, and in two separate cases, two separate examiners, the examiner said, well, we received new guidance from the patent office, and I'm withdrawing my 101 rejection on these claims, they're okay. So that's huge, that's very, very good news, but it is also true that this is the patent office's guidance, not the Supreme Court, and so a lot of these patents that have issued under this new guidance, as far as I know, have not yet been challenged. So it remains to be seen what will happen, but it is a breath of fresh air, we can hope. The situation in Europe has actually historically been a little bit easier. 
Uh, Europe does also list um, a number of exclusions from patentable subject matter, and that includes what used to be called computer programs, today we would call software, or mathematical methods. However, like the US Patent Office, the European Patent Office issued guidelines in 2018 on the topic, and they said it must be taken into account whether the method in the context of the invention serves a technical purpose. In other parts of their guidance, they said that it has to be taken into account whether the invention has a technical character. And so two specific examples that they have allowed, which probably would not have been allowed in the US before the US guidance, two specific examples were controlling a specific, like a manufacturing process or a process of running an x-ray apparatus. And they said that as long as this algorithm or the patent is controlling this very specific thing, an x-ray apparatus, a piece of hardware, or a, a, a steel refinery, it's OK. And they specifically said, and this is very important to me, that providing a medical diagnosis by an automated system processing physiological measurements is acceptable, is patentable. So as in the US, in Europe, the strategy since, um, well, since the Alice ruling and just in light of uh, long time, long standing European patent law has been to claim a very tangible result or a technical implementation that's specific to the intended use of the invention. So we could talk about this for a very long time. This is probably more familiar to all of you than to, than to me, but I did just want to mention this because this is sort of the context of artificial intelligence. But it's also true that artificial intelligence faces some additional challenges unique to the field. We've talked about patent eligible subject matter, but there's also novelty. Many, many wonderful, perfectly useful artificial intelligence inventions do not have a proprietary intelligence engine at the center. That, that neural network, that deep learning network, is today available for download either for free or um, there are commercial applications. You can perform all of that up in the cloud. And so, you can end up with a very unique system capable of producing a very powerful result that would not at all be obvious to a human, but yet where's the novelty in that? The engine itself is sort of tried and true canned technology. So novelty can be an issue. Obviousness is also an issue, somewhat, somewhat similar to that. Um, at, at some point, it becomes obvious, particular as artificial intelligence engines grow in capability and become more and more and more powerful, it becomes sort of increasingly obvious that if you just take all kinds of data from all sorts of sources and process it and feed it in, that useful results are going to come out. And so in the old days, one skilled in the art meant a human of sort of average knowledge in the field, but that, that bar is rising, that bar of what skilled in the art means is rising. And particularly as, uh, you know, as we go into Barber's talk and we talk about artificial intelligence uh, inventions by AI, um, you know, AI can be going out and looking at scientific and patent literature, legal cases, and just assembling all kinds of things from thousands of, and tens of thousands of different pieces of, um, of prior art. How do you put together an IDS around that? Um, at some point, doesn't everything become obvious if you have the sum total of human knowledge in front of you? So it is, it is this bar of what it means to be skilled in the art is going to increase over time and is going to present a challenge to the, to the patenting system. Enablement. Uh, lots of times what comes out of that deep learning system is a bunch of coefficients and weights and biases that really mean nothing to a human, but it, it works. But how do, you, how do you explain in a way that somebody else could replicate, other than just typing in the same biases and weights, which is fairly easy to get around, how do you explain how that's working? In my field where you're talking with the FDA, enablement is also a, a, a real problem. The FDA wants to understand how a medic, the Food and Drug Administration wants to understand how an invention works. How is it that it's helping cure the human condition? So en just enablement can be really quite a, quite a difficult thing for an artificial intelligence system which has been optimized by another computer. It can be very difficult, of course, to detect infringement. Uh, who knows what's in that black box? That black box might not be published. It might not be, um, you know, at all obvious how it's producing its result. And so detection and proof of infringement can be very difficult. 
And then Barbara, again, will be talking more about the inventorship and ownership question of inventions that purely come from AI. So at MIT, um, we are applying for lots and lots of patents in artificial intelligence. Uh, I think the WIPO report from a year or two ago, I saw Mitch um, cited it in, in one of his slides. I think MIT is most, most patenting of the artificial intelligence from universities is coming out of China. I think the top seven institutions are from China. But in the US, MIT is in the top handful. So I think probably overall, top 10 universities in the world patenting AI. We're doing a lot of patenting in AI. But it's also true that for some of the reasons I've discussed, a very valuable implementation may not be patentable. And I think I, I can skip the first one. We talked about that. But in the case, for example, of a medical device, isn't it obvious that if you measure a patient's temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, the oxygen content of their blood, their respiration rate, the amount of oxygen in their breath, the amount of CO2 in their breath, all the sort of things that a doctor, you know, an old-fashioned country doctor used to men measure and all the things that are now becoming possible with bedside uh, monitors, isn't it obvious that if you put all this stuff together and feed it into an AI algorithm, you're going to have a better way to detect sepsis, for example, earlier than a human doctor. So, I mean, at some point that just becomes obvious. Just throw all the data in and, of course, it's going to work. And then often the training method or that extraction of feature might not be patentable but yet very valuable and best protected as know-how. So on the other hand, and this is a realization that MIT is coming to over time, the input data itself may well be the most valuable part of the AI invention. Um, obviously, a company like Google or Facebook or Amazon has access to data, the spending patterns, the habits, the sleeping time, or you know, the, the bedtimes of millions and millions of users, their um, internet search histories. Very, very expensive, very difficult to acquire, very, very valuable when fed into an artificial intelligence um, learning. Human medical data is another example. Uh, human data is extremely expensive to acquire, takes a long time, very highly regulated by the Food and Drug Administration or its non-U.S. equivalents. And of course, the data could come from in wildly different formats or geometrically dispersed. So we're increasingly uh, encouraging inventors who are starting startups to protect their data as a trade secret. A trade secret, you don't have to worry about enabling the competitors. It, you know, it's really the data that, that is what is valuable. Um, you don't even have to reveal anything about the black box, the AI black box. You don't teach any of the competitors, and you immediately have advantage. You're not waiting for the evolution of the sort of the Alice ruling and wondering whether your patent is going to be issued or not. You're not publishing your invention in the patent literature. Cons, of course, is there are no legal barrier to competition. The barrier really is the difficulty of acquiring the data, but the data can be replicated by anybody that puts sufficient money into it. And also in the case of startups, it is true that investors really want to see a patent. And they're much less comfortable with copyright software or protecting data as a trade secret. It's also true that most hospitals, and I'm very familiar with the Boston, the hospitals in Boston, Massachusetts. MIT doesn't have a medical school. So our scientists and engineers collaborate with the Boston hospitals, Massachusetts General Hospital, Brigham and Women's, Dana-Farber, Beth Israel. We have many, many world-class hospitals. Most hospitals, all of them in Boston, and I think most hospitals in the US, are not comfortable licensing data that is acquired in their clinical trials on an exclusive basis. They want the data to be disseminated and published and sent out there. And so, the data might be the valuable thing, but a startup may not be able to get exclusive access to that data. So there are pros and cons to this approach, but it is definitely something that, that should be considered. So um, you know, back to that, that general drawing of machine learning, and what do you patent? Do you patent the, the AI itself as a, uh, as a, as a classifier? This is, this is an example, um, a very early patent dating from 2009, uh, assigned to MIT, MIT inventors, that in fact patents the deep learning structure, you know, that, that, that network of nodes and connections that I showed where they're talking about specific ways of connecting the layers and hierarchies and allowing bypass routes and feedback. 
And so this is, this is a granted patent that was allowed. It was pre-ALICE. Um, another, I'm going to show you another uh, granted patent where we patented the pre-processing as well as the overall feature. This again was um, granted, issued to MIT. And um, there's a continuation also that's going through the patent office post the 2019 guidance. And this was, a, this was an invention to try to detect uh, neurological disease by the pattern of a person typing on a keyboard. And so this is a figure from the patent where a person is typing at the keyboard. There's an application, could be on their cell phone or on their computer, that's collecting the timing of their keystrokes. That's fed to um, an input analyzer, which makes some fa fairly simple pre-processing operations on those keystroke timings. And then it goes to the motor function analyzer, which in fact is a deep learning network. And so as an example of the sort of the raw data and the pre-processing, this is a very simple example where, let's see which one's the best one to point to, where as you type at your keyboard, the application is measuring the time where you lift your finger on a key, where you put the finger down, where you lift the key up, you put the key down, up and down, and it's measuring hold times, times between different keystrokes, the amount of time the stroke, the, the key is down, and then how long it takes to lift it. You could think of other kinds of things. You could think of measuring the differences between all the keystrokes that are on your right hand and your left hand versus when keystrokes alternate between your hands. There's lots of other sorts of proof processing you could consider. They chose these, this fairly simple list. And so these claims are really directed towards that pre-processing rather than the machine learning itself. In this case, the machine learning algorithm was canned, was a, a, standard, uh, a standard application available. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Barbara. They, there's a famous picture. There's actually about 10 of these pictures out there on the internet. Um, you know, the first, the first picture shows bagels and puppies, and the second picture shows chihuahuas and blueberry muffins, just as an example of how difficult it can be, and this is, these are sort of standard tests that one puts a, an AI algorithm to when you're doing image recognition. You know, which are the bagels, which are the puppies, which are the muffins, which are the puffies. Puffies are very popular in, in, in the field. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm here to talk to you today about um, protecting inventions, and in particular, ownership and inventorship issues. Um, and I come to this from a little bit different perspective in that I get the patent after it's issued and um, when there's been a commercially successful embodiment or alleged embodiment and tend to get involved in, di in disputes around who the correct inventors are or um, in the case of uh, maybe fights about a joint collaboration, who the, who the appropriate owners are. So Mitch has already given you, um, given you some data on the growth of AI, and I won't go over this. It's a, probably a little bit dated. Um, but what I will just say in a, in a single sentence is that AI is everywhere. It's not going away. Um, just two weeks ago, I think there was a panel in Boston um, for life sciences CEOs. There are a lot of them in Boston, and it was all about AI. So it's here to stay, and it's not going to be limited to any particular field of technology. So as we think about uh, inventorship, in particular of AI going forward, we need to think about whether, as a, a society or as a world, whether we think um, there needs to be a human touch. Is that the right way to approach AI-generated inventions going forward? And so it seemed obvious um, that we should start really with the case that's probably the most familiar to all of us, which is a copyright case, but it's the, the famous monkey selfie case. Um, and it really tees up some of the issues quite nicely. So a photographer travels to a national park in Indonesia. He puts his camera, he claims he puts his camera on a tripod and a curious monkey um, named Narito comes and is drawn to the reflection in the lens. Um, he takes a couple of selfies they're not very good, so the photographer adjusts the settings on the cameras. Then Narito takes a couple of pictures. Actually, I've only put one up here, but he also has one where he's kind of um, had his 
has his head tilted at the camera, and that's also out there. Um, they're beautiful pictures. The expression on the monkey's face is really priceless. And so the photographer circulates the pictures to news sources, and Wikipedia ends up posting um, the photos, which is what leads to the dispute. Um, and the question becomes, who owns the rights to the picture? Who owns the copyright? Is it the monkey? Is it the photographer? Because he exercised that human touch, that, ar that artistic judgment in the way that he set up the camera. Um, the national park, where the monkey lives, or no one at all. It should just be in the public domain. So there are some different answers that can come out of this. Um, in 2014, the Copyright Office in the United States said works created by animals belong to the public. There's no copyright whatsoever. Um, PETA, the animal rights organization, brought a case um, suing the photographer on behalf of the monkey um, to obtain cop the copyright in the photos. Um, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals dismissed that case. Actually, the district court dismissed, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed that animals lack standing to sue for copyright infringement. Subsequently, there was a settlement um, between PETA and the photographer under which I have heard the photographer is paying 25% of his royalties um, to the national park where Narito lives. So, um, so that case will never make its way up to our US Supreme Court um, for a final decision. Um, in the EU, there are some similar cases from which we can maybe draw some lessons. There it would seem in the um, Painter case that the photographer's role in a picture such as this in this case, it was a portrait of a, of a girl who had been kidnapped. That photographer's creative choices um, conferred sufficient originality such that the, um, there is copyright protection over that, um, over that portrait. And in the UK, I've just cited a rule that says that in the case where there's an artistic or other work that's computer generated, then there's an, the author is assumed to be the person who made the arrangements necessary to create the work. So an analogous situation as the photographer kind of setting up um, the camera settings um, for um, an animal to take a selfie. So that's the copyright context. So we're a little bit further ahead in the thought process on that. I guess things are a little bit further developed. Um, and we can talk about whether that's right or not. Um, but how about patent law? Um, under U.S. patent law currently, um, there is a lot of language in statutes and case law that says the inventor has to be a person. Um, so the definition of an inventor in our um, patent statute is that inventor is an individual or perhaps a collection of individuals who invent or discover the subject matter of the invention. And under U.S. law, as we think about who constitutes an inventor, we think very much on the act of conceiving the invention. Conception is the touchstone, it's said. And it's defined as the formation in the mind of the inventor, so in the person's mind, of a definite and permanent idea of what the complete and operative invention is. So it seems pretty grounded in the, the human experience. I'm going to put up. Um, a couple of quotes about a joint invention, too, because I think, um, and Mitch spoke about this, there is the possibility of um, collaboration between the human and the AI entity. Um, and it may be that those are the cases that, that come up um, to the courts first, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but again, we see language in court cases that say a joint invention is the product of a collaboration between two or more persons. Um, so, um, so we seem pretty grounded in this personhood concept. And in fact, there's even a federal circuit case that says that it has to be a person that, make, that conceives and companies cannot do so. So in an attempt to name a legal entity as an inventor was rejected by the federal circuit. To some extent, you see in our US Constitution sort of this, this the basis lies in the Constitution itself, right? It's sort of steeped in the very essence of the foundation of our country. Um, Article 1, Section 8 says that Congress has the power to promote the progress of sciences and the useful arts by securing, for a limited time only, rights for authors and inventors. 
So how does that compare to around the world? Um, it would seem that most countries are wrestling with the same set of issues, very grounded in personhood. In China, an inventor or designer is defined as any person who's made a creative contribution. Um, and there are examination guidelines that, consistent with the United States, say that a company cannot be an inventor. Likewise, in Korea, inventors have to be individuals. Although, interestingly, there have apparently been some attempts to address AI-created inventions in the legislature. We're not there yet. Um, in Europe, the EPC doesn't define inventor, and to some extent there's, a, there's less of a focus actually on the inventor in Europe. There's just an assumption that the applicant of the patent application is entitled to the, to the patent as a matter of procedure, and there's not really a challenge process um, in, the, in the EPO the way there is, for example, in the United States. Um, and there are ways to work out in the various contracting um, jurisdictions um, who actually owns the patent in the event that there's a dispute. And then again, in Japan, the inventive entity must be a natural person. So we, um, and I think the world right now is stepping back to say, is, is that right? Um, does it, is it right that, the pers that a person has to be um, an inventor? Or is there some other alternative? Well, let's, Let's just think for a second about who could be the possible inventors in the context of an AI-generated invention. And you could say that the programmer, perhaps, should be an inventor, that a researcher working with the programmer to solve a particular problem maybe is a co-inventor, um, the individual or individuals who are providing the data and who are actually making the selection of which data sets should be provided um, for training purposes to the AI entity. There may be a researcher reviewing output at the other end to make some decisions. And of course, the AI entity itself um, could be making inventive contributions in its deep learning, with its deep learning capacity. Now, in some ways, stepping back from all the, the law that I just read to you, um, in some ways, this team doesn't actually seem like that big of a leap from what we look at in the United States. Um, you know, patents are frequently subject to litigation. They're subject to a standard of, um, how one of one, how a person of ordinary skill in the art would view them. We use that for claim construction purposes. We use that to determine obviousness, um, and whether 112 requirements have been met. And we've moved past that age when the inventor had, or when the person of ordinary skill in the art was actually defined as a single hypothetical person. I think that we now have this construct where in court there can be a team of people, right? Just as there can really be an inventive team of people who as co-inventors come to the invention together and they may bring different things to the table um, and they individually may not even all fully understand the invention or have been there at the table for the completion of conception. So, so we need to press ourselves a little bit on whether this human inventor requirement is it a relic of the past? Is it something that just exists? Is the language that we see in the statute and even in the Constitution um, and in, in laws around the world, is that just a, um, a relic of what we've known? Or does it really represent something more? Is it really a policy-driven judgment that, that is applicable going forward with AI-generated inventions? So, so I we'll get a little theoretical on you all and ask you just to consider whether um, do we need some form of protection, whether it's patent or copyright or other protection to protect purely AI created inventions. Is that necessary to incentivize innovation? That is the basis for the US patent and copyright system was that humans needed a nudge, right? They needed a reward um, for making the innovation and sharing it with the rest of the world, to d disclosing it. Is that really true for, for AI entities? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I think that's something that we really need to think about. Is all this innovation going to happen anyway? Another, another thing we need to consider, and I think this was alluded to in, in Ben's presentation, is, is if we allow patenting of pure AI-created inventions, are we creating or 
are we enabling, if you will, a first mover advantage? So the people are, the companies that are at the front of the pack right now, are they gonna develop such an advantage that we're gonna see a huge innovation gap between the large companies um, who are already out there with AI and, and smaller companies or even universities so that we'll actually ultimately stifle future innovation? That's, I think, a very important consideration. Um, people, companies that control, let's say, platform technology, if they were to get patents on them, could actually keep others, they had brought enough claims, could keep others from continuing to innovate or even have the ability to design around depending on their breadth. Now, historically, one counter to that has been in order to obtain broad claims, let's say about a method or a process, one needed to provide broad disclosure to support those claims, right? So we have to, in an instance where someone wanted a broad set of claims around, let's say, an AI um, created and performed process, um, they would likely need to disclose a vast amount of data. And as Ben indicated, we might have a lot of companies in the world that are gonna make the decision that they don't wanna have to disclose that data to provide the support they need to get the claims that they get and they may hold that back as trade secrets. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of policy considerations here, and some have suggested that perhaps there's a middle ground, particularly in the patent context, where currently in the United States and around the world, there's a pretty significant patent term. Um, maybe for an AI invention, we don't need that long of a term. Maybe there should be something, some shorter patent term, because frankly, if AI-generated uh, inventions continue somehow to build on each other, then maybe the, the early patents will be outmoded quickly. No one will be practicing them anyway, perhaps. Um, and they won't be valuable. They won't be needed to protect the innovation for more than seven to 10 years. And as Ben also mentioned, there's a question about in the context of these AI-generated inventions, perhaps we need to um, put a check on them a little bit and require some sort of a heightened obviousness standard in light of the fact that the AI entity may very well know um, the breadth of all human knowledge. And so that shouldn't the standard um, person of ordinary skills um, concept that we know may not work to judge the obviousness of an AI generated invention. So maybe an AI entity should be recognized as an owner, inventor. We could give an AI entity legal personhood, a status, something like a corporate status. Um, there are AI entities that have been recognized, jurisdiction around, jurisdictions around the world for limited um, purposes. It strikes me as a possibility that should be considered, but there are some pretty broad implications that we'd also need to think about. I mean, if you think about each of your own um, very um, well-established and developed corporate laws, um, there would need to be something akin to that that would govern the behavior, if you will, of, of the AI entity. We would need to think carefully about whether that AI entity would um, have certain responsibilities, whether they'd be held to certain obligations, would there need to be people associated with or behind that AI entity in the way that we can reach behind the corporate veil sometimes when necessary to, to ensure that the, um, the company is acting responsibly. And then we'd also need to think about what happens um, when the AI entity is a co-owner or a co-inventor of a human working in collaboration, um, how, how would that work? It may be that we won't have the luxury of separating out in some way AI and generated inventions on their own, and that we really need to address that gray area where there are these collaborations between humans and AI entities. And I think in some ways that may be the, the toughest, um, some of the tougher problems that we face. But ultimately, um, I think the real issue here is ownership. Who owns the ultimate invention? And I postulate that most of the practical problems that we have 
around AI-generated inventions could really be addressed by thinking about who's the correct owner. And ownership of inventions and patents um, can largely be governed by contract. Um, so today, you know, most inventions made by human beings are assigned to legal persons. They don't stay in the hands of the individual inventor. A government or a company owns them. Copyright work for hire is an example of a contract mechanism for ownership by a company. Likewise, in the patent context, employ standard employee agreements require employees to assign um, the rights to any work that they performed during the course of their employment to their employer. And even in the context of sort of inter-institutional agreements, when two companies are working together or a company is working with a university, there are agreements typically in place that govern ownership. Increasingly, that ownership um, clause is independent of which company or entity's employees make the invention, and that's to ensure certainty. So there may be a particular field within which, in the collaboration, where one company owns everything, just to be clear. So there's no surprise if the other, companies, the other company has an employee who makes a contribution to the invention. That employee may very well be named as an inventor, but it doesn't ultimately challenge or undermine the expectations of the companies about who's gonna own what comes out of that collaboration. And that's frankly the way most um, sophisticated companies are dealing with inventorship situations nowadays. So I think that um, we can take these concepts that are currently you know, in play, particularly from the joint collaboration context and apply them to, to the AI situation. We just, you know, to the extent that we can predict what's gonna happen with AI-generated inventions, we can take care of ownership issues through contract. We simply specify who owns this, which specific IP generated by the use of the AI. So that may be in the form of a license agreement in which um, along with the sale of the, the machine, there is a license to use the AI um, or license to use whatever is generated um, by the AI entity um, and the ability to convey or perhaps sublicense those rights or that output to others. You can imagine situations where almost like a complete sale of the entity or the software, all of the IP could go with the purchaser. There may be other instances where just like a limited field of use license agreement like we see today. Um, there could be situations where the, I guess the original owner, the AI company, let's say, could, could sell the AI entity to a particular company to be used in a limited field and only grant a license for use in that field. Could also imagine situations where there would just be apply, implied agreements, right? Sort of akin to the situation of I hired you to invent something for me, um, and the question would then become, well, was it reasonably foreseeable that I would use the AI entity that I purchased from you to perform to solve this problem? And if so, then I should be entitled to own what comes out of it. And if not, um, if I made some tweaks. Um, in some way that was outside the scope of what you intended, I was doing something outside of the original intention of the AI entity, then, then maybe a, a, there should be different ownership. One thing that I want to raise that comes up a lot um, that we really, you will really need to think about if you are engaged in, in working on these contractual relationships or if you happen to be at a company is that things always fall through the cracks. I'm telling you that contract law can take care of everything, but you need to be on your toes. So collaborators could creep in through side doors and back doors in ways with employees who are just doing their job. They're just trying to get their work done. And they call on you know, troubleshooters at the original company um, or use a service agreement to help um, with the invention or help solve a problem which could make that troubleshooter um, or that person at a help desk someday become an inventor. And so you just need to think through 
um, and be aware of all the various situations in which um, someone could contribute to this, um, to this ultimately AI-generated invention, perhaps. And also be very aware of the data sets that get used to train the AI entity. Um, if you don't own those data sets or if you have a limited right to use the data set um, and you use it beyond its intended purpose, somebody could come after you um, making an ownership claim about that. So I don't have the answers, um, but I think that using the existing paradigms within which we work and think about inventorship and ownership do give us some guidance going forward. And in the meantime, we have all of our governments really thinking through what should happen and hopefully, hopefully getting a little bit ahead of the game. So we just wanted to end with a note that um, the USPTO has set out a request for comments directed to AI-generated inventions on patent-related issues. Those comments are due um, by November 8th. So we're seeing our patent office looking into this issue. And last week, the director, um, Director Yonku, actually announced that soon thereafter, they would be issuing another request for comments on copyright, trademark, trade secrets, and asking um, how AI fits in with the, our current laws there, and also asking really the largest question of all, which is whether there needs to be some new form of IP to address AI-generated inventions that doesn't currently exist. And I think that that's, um, that's a question that we may be wrestling with for um, quite some time, but um, it will certainly be interesting and it will keep all of us um, employed, at least. Um, so thank you. Ben, Barbara, thank you very much. That was, uh, there was a lot of information, a lot to cover. Uh, and I know people are probably anxious to get moving, but I'm going to start uh, by just asking a general question. Given that you cannot protect an AI-generated invention today, what advice would you give your clients if you think that there was an AI involved in the generation of an invention that you're dealing with, either at the disclosure stage or uh, Barbara during a litigation scenario? Okay. I mean, I think it may already be happening. Right, and we may already have, um, the question really becomes when the AI uh, entity, if you will, is no longer a pair of hands, essentially like a lab technician, and is just running things so that the inventor doesn't have to run the calculations, and when that shifts over to potentially an inventive contribution. Um, you know, under the current law, I think if you decide that you want to patent this invention, you come at it from the, the programmer, the researcher, who's asking the question, who's seeing the output, and making the determination as a human being that this is solving the problem. Um, at the end of the day, under US law, let's say you, you aren't entirely sure whether someone should be included as an inventor or not. It's not that big of a deal. It can be fixed as long as you're acting in good faith. Um, and it's a lot easier, of course, if all of those co-inventors all have the obligation to assign their rights to you, the company, so there's no fight about who actually owns the invention. Um, but I, I do predict that one day, some company that doesn't have a large or maybe any AI portfolio will be sued by a company that does and will challenge the patent that's being asserted against them saying that it is invalid because it was not made completely by human inventors. And that US law, the argument will be doesn't recognize non-human inventors and therefore the patent cannot be corrected and is invalid and can't be enforced against that entity. I, I think we will see that day come. And there's not a lot we can do about it until, until we see, um, I mean, perhaps the courts would reject that argument. I guess that remains to be seen. 
Um, they may follow the lead of whatever the PTO does, but um, there's no 100% insurance policy on that one. Yeah. I guess at MIT, in light of Alice, we've been recommending to lots of inventors or notifying lots of inventors that we're not going to file on an invention because patent law just isn't going to permit it. Our, our goals are obviously very different from a company. Um, our, our goals are to disseminate information, and so we routinely tell people this isn't patentable, and MIT's mission is to publish and get this out for the public good, and patenting would be a great route, but it's not open to us right now, so by all means, publish it and, um, you know, disseminate it that way. Um, it's, it's sad. Um, it's, it's also true that often, at least today with a pure AI inventions, I mean, how important is a fractal container or a flashing light? They're kind of they're dumb inventions. Um, they're interesting from a scientific and engineering point of view that they've been invented by AI, but I picture something like that being invented at MIT, and what people are going to be interested in is the engine that, that did that invention, not so much in the invention itself. And so um, I would also, I guess, encourage them, us, with our patent attorneys to look at what aspects of the invention of the engine itself could be patented as opposed to the invention that came out of it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just open it up to see if there are any questions from the floor before we move on. Uh, somebody in the back? Is there a microphone? Hi, I'm uh, Danny Huntington from the U.S. Um, Barbara, your presentation was excellent. Uh, just a few observations that I would suggest uh, you, you might think about. One is you can't really change the term of a patent without violating the TRIPS agreement because it provides that regardless of the technology, you have to have equal protection, essentially. So it, it would require renegotiating that to change the term. But on the other hand, I think the issue will largely be taken care of by the scope of the claims. So if we go back to biotechnology in 1985, there was a patent issued with uh, just two words, human interferon. And of course, much too broad. And over a period of time, that scope was determined. And I think the same thing will happen with, uh, regardless of the technology. And that's what you see with the notice that you uh, indicated the patent office is looking at because it will be taken care of by description and enablement, things like that. So um, I think it will be interesting to see the question of since artificial intelligence, not really intelligence it, it, because it thinks about a different way, but it does uh, mean that the standard for deciding what's inventive may well be raised. Um, the, the last thing that I would say is, is I think you touched on the point about how much is really going to be disclosed. And if you think about it, for instance, uh, in the testing of DNA, the machines are sold, but realistically, you'll have these vast uh, places where everybody sends their sample for analysis, and they keep some of those details as trade secrets, so that you, because you have to have such high accuracy that you're not going to just have other people doing it. So. I, I think there'll be a lot more of, um, of that type of thing, of keeping things trade secrets. And the last thing is, um, you think about with the genetically engineered corns, for instance, and soybeans, there are bag tags that say, when you buy this, you're only going to use it for certain purposes, and I assume those same kinds of things will be done with some of these uh, uh, techniques that when they're licensed, they'll agree, in essence, not to make the invention, or as you said, that the invention would belong to the company. So there'll be a great deal of work in terms of uh, drafting the agreements, just as you said. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but uh, it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. What exactly is the question? Yeah. 
Yeah, what exactly is, is the question? Is it just an observation and you'd like our thoughts on it, or? No, I, I didn't, it wasn't necessarily a question, it was observations, but I would welcome any thoughts you have about them. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think trade secrets are going to become increasingly important. The data is increasingly valuable, as I've said. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have anything much more than that to, to offer. I don't know. I guess your reference to the um, genetically modified seed was an interesting one because it just called to mind a point that Ben made earlier, which we didn't really have a chance to talk about at all. But in a lot of instances, how valuable, how valuable are these patents going to be? Or even the field of use licenses, if you will, um, it's going to be really, really hard to enforce. It's going to be really hard to figure out whether somebody is, um, you know, using your invention when it's, I mean, it's really akin to kind of manufacturing methods, which tend to be pretty difficult to, um, to assess from the outside when you can't get into your competitor's factory, whether or not they may be using your manufacturing method or not. So the policing process is also going to be difficult, which may also result in fewer patent applications um, for additional reasons, not because they don't want to disclose, but you know, on balance when you, when you say, or, here's what I'm going to have to disclose and how frequently really am I going to be able to enforce this. Really what I'm doing is teaching my competitors how to practice my invention and maybe I don't want to be doing that. So mm -hmm. um, I really do think it's going to tip the balance pretty strongly in favor of trade secrets in, in a lot of instances, um, particularly if we do see this dichotomy between first movers and everybody else. Um, the first mover advantage will just, can probably be extended in some ways longer through trade secrets than any other form yeah. of, of IP protection. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I just have, have one, one last question just to, to build up on a, on a point that Ben raised. Uh, you had talked about uh, the fact that these computers have many, many more types of information available and that could affect what a person of ordinary skill in the art would know. And during a, a prosecution, at least in the United States, the inventors are obligated to disclose documents that they believe are relevant. They're just required to sign a declaration stating that they believe they're the first one to invent. Uh, how do you see the fact that you can't tell what's going on inside the computer affecting a situation where uh, the, the computer can't sign these? Mm -hmm. and, and you just, what, what changes do you see that might be occurring during the, the prosecution process with formalities and examination? It could be that the invention disclosure statement has to raise up a level of abstraction. It might be that one can't list every single scientific paper or every single patent. For example, at MIT, there's a really interesting invention, and I don't know the status of the patent application. I don't know if it's been granted, but a professor and several of his postdocs have created a machine learning invention that mines metabolic databases. So there's all kinds of information about what biomarkers in the body increase under what conditions and how they're linked one to another. And the belief is, and it seems to be playing out, that by mining all of these different databases, and the database consists, as you can imagine, each individual database consists of thousands or millions of points, but, but there's this database produced by this hospital and there's this database produced by that hospital. And the belief is that by linking all these databases together, new drugs can be discovered. Often drugs, the composition of matter might be known, it might be a drug that was developed by a pharmaceutical company and put on the shelf. But by linking all these different databases and mining it through artificial intelligence, new drugs can be discovered. And so it could be that the invention disclosure system is just pointing to a database, you know, rather than to very specific papers or very specific patents. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer. I think that's evolving. In that case, typically the drugs that are discovered are also known. There's not going to be composition of matter patents available. 
And if there were, who was the inventor of them? There's lots of interesting questions there. Yeah, and of course, if you have uh, a linking to a database with thousands of references in them, uh, that makes it very difficult for a human examiner to consider them because it, Absolutely. if you disclose it, they're all presumed to be reviewed, but uh, we all, as attorneys, know at some point when there are hundreds and thousands of references, that's a legal fiction, and, and nobody right. really reads them all. Right, yeah. Well, I, I would love to stay and chat. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of other interesting questions, but I think um, we're running really late. So I'm going to close the, the session now. If anybody has any other questions, uh, our, my contact information, Barbara's and Ben's, are, are in the presentation materials. And please feel free to reach out and find us at the program or by email. And thank you all very much. Thank you.